Um, as frequently said, birth defects were the hallmark for Zika infections. Um, but we also need to know we only discovered the signal uh, when there was enough, a, a, a significant number of persons infected, right? So um, uh, Africa may have had, we know that Africa had Zika for decades. Maybe it was missed as a signal, maybe because uh, Zika infections were just anecdotal, but maybe also because of, um, of, uh, of suboptimal birth defect surveillance. Hence, the idea came up to develop an easy to use app to facilitate uh, the early identification of global birth defects. And now over to Helen Dolk, who led this very important work. Helen Dolk is, uh, is a professor at, at Ulster University. So uh, um, over to you, Helen, thank you. Thank you very much, Annalise. Um, and hello, everybody. I'm sorry, I can't actually see you, but I know you're there. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay, so I'm, um, as Annalise said, going to talk to you about um, how we developed the Global Birth Defect app to harness uh, mobile technology to develop birth defect surveillance globally. Uh, more than 5 million babies are born every year globally with major congenital anomalies. Um, I'll be using congenital anomalies and birth defects as interchangeable terms for the purposes of this uh, talk. And they're across all the different organ systems. And at the top there, you see about 10% um, would be normally nervous system defects, which include, of course, microcephaly, a major feature of the congenital Zika um, syndrome. Um, we know that uh, 3,617 cases were officially reported to uh, PAHO during the main uh, Zika epidemic. Um, and uh, uh, you saw a wonderful film of the work done by Merg on congenital Zika syndrome um, just earlier in this, in this webinar. The congenital anomalies are the fourth leading cause of mortality under five years of age, and they're rising in relative importance as more work is being done on other causes, but not so much on congenital anomalies. So if we're to meet the Sustainable Development Goal 3.2 by 2030, end preventable deaths of newborns and under five children, we have to do something about birth defects in terms of both preventing them and improving survival, improving treatment and survival. But despite their very important role as a cause of uh, child mortality, most children with congenital anomalies survive the first five years of life, as is indeed true, as you saw in the film, of congenital Zika syndrome. A huge impact on individuals, families and communities with multidisciplinary health and social care needs. And as said very well in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So we have a huge agenda to work on with congenital anomalies uh, worldwide. We have to remember that birth defects are preventable there's a host of maternal risk factors known to cause uh, congenital anomalies, of which Zika and maternal infections in general are one. But um, uh, we're not doing very much about actually working on what we know to prevent birth defects or doing enough research on finding out the unknown, presently unknown causes of birth defects. So, um, in 2010, the World Health uh, Assembly, recognizing this situation, uh, put out a birth defects resolution, agreed a birth defects resolution to redress the limited focus to date on prevention, care and support, especially in low and middle income countries. And they recommended strengthening registration and surveillance systems so that we have more information on what's happening and the causes of birth defects and tracking the success of preventive efforts where they exist. 
And these recommendations were really reinforced by the Zika epidemic. The Zika epidemic was a case in point of where uh, it was clear that registration and surveillance needs to be strengthened, as indeed Annalise said in her introduction. At the core of surveillance is congenital anomaly diagnosis and recording. It needs to be accurate, that is specific to the defect and complete. And this is particularly important in low resource areas where the uh, expertise to diagnose and to describe accurately and code the congenital anomalies is lacking. So that really hampers the potential for surveillance. So the WHO recently uh, revised its quick reference handbook for birth defect surveillance um, that you can see there. But our task uh, was to develop an app and use the potential for mobile technology across um, uh, um, low and middle income countries to be able to describe and code better externally visible congenital anomalies at the time of birth or soon after for use by non-experts um, for potential use offline, so it doesn't require Wi-Fi um, to, to be used. And this um, app is now available in the, uh, both the Apple and the Google Play stores, and it's available in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. We set up for um, developing this app an international com committee of experts from around the world on congenital anomaly surveillance. And that was a very important part of validating the, um, uh, the app as a surveillance tool. And the app, in the end, during the development process, we realized that it needed to, um, uh, to exist in two versions. The basic version is a reference version. It's like a lookup tool um, that gives images and uh, international classification disease codes and descriptions of 85 major externally visible anomalies and nine syndromes, also neonatal examination videos and links to relevant materials. The surveillance version allows, in addition, um, the recording of data, data uh, that will uh, help interpret the diagnosis of the, uh, the baby and to take a photo for the test version of the, uh, of the app and to upload that data to a server where the a secure server where the uh, surveillance center can then download the data again and match it with other data that they have on the baby. So it looks like this, this is the home page. You tap on birth defects, um, the, the user registers beforehand, but taps on birth defects. Um, comes to a baby that flips back to front very easily, and the user can tap on the area that is involved when they see the baby. And um, tap on the area of interest, in this, uh, in this case, the arm. Then they're um, presented with a number of different options of types of anomaly. Um, they can select the type of anomaly that seems most appropriate and find the term, the code, and a description, etc. The app includes differential diagnosis tips between similar anomalies. And for the surveillance version, as I said, uh, data can be recorded and uploaded to a server. For microcephaly, very important for congenital Zika syndrome, there are head circumference measurement videos and tables to teach people how to diagnose um, microcephaly, how to record it, and a microcephaly calculator so that when one puts in the gestational age and the head circumference and the sex of the baby, the um, uh, app tells you whether this is indeed small for gestational age and qualifies as microcephaly or as severe microcephaly. There's a special module on congenital Zika syndrome itself, which points out the different anomalies that are associated. Microcephaly are the brain anomalies, eye abnormalities, um, uh, contractures, etc. And encourages the recording of evidence of uh, maternal 
for fetal Zika infection. And importantly, we worked with our partners on uh, in the Zika plan project with uh, Trudy Lang and her team at the Global Health Network to establish the Global Birth Defects uh, member hub. And that is the home, if you like, of the app, because uh, we've been able to put up on that hub now uh, instructional videos on how to use the app, on how to register for the app, on how to navigate through the app. And this means that we can really build on the, um, on the instructional value and the training value of the app. So the legacy then is that we've taken some steps towards exploiting the huge potential of mobile health for congenital anomaly surveillance, diagnosis and care in low resource areas. And there's a lot more now that can be done. Um, the uh, basic version of the app has been downloaded in 38 countries. Uh, it's there ready for the next Zika ep epidemic. Um, the surveillance version of the app is currently being tested in different surveillance um, and research contexts, mainly in Africa, in Kenya, and in South Africa, and soon in uh, Burkina Faso. For example, in relation to medication safety in pregnancy, antiretrovirals and anti, uh, anti-malarials. But this testing was delayed by uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, so it's it's currently ongoing. Uh, the Jeep, uh, the app will be taken over by the WHO, we hope in the next um, few years, to form part of the birth defect surveillance toolkit. So we're doing some work at the moment to make sure that it's entirely compatible with the quick, quick reference handbook. Uh, and then we have as well the uh, Global Birth Defects Member Hub now on the Global Health Network, which is so important to mainstream birth defect surveillance and prevention as part of global public health to really give it much greater visibility. You're going to hear next from uh, Professor Ieda Orioli on the RELAMP network, which is the congenital anomaly network that's been set up as part of Zika plan uh, in uh, Latin America. But we now also, um, uh, consequent on all this work, have funding for a new network in Africa where there's very much less activity on congenital anomalies, an African network for congenital anomaly surveillance, prevention and care that's led by uh, Ugandan partners. And um, that's uh, an MRC funded seed grant that has come directly from this project also. So I'd like to thank, of course, the European Union for the funding for this project and thank you for your attention. I'm quite happy to um, answer questions later on in the session. Thank you, thank you, Helen. And it really shows you've really shown the legacy beyond beyond Zika. You also have shown what what Trudy also you know highlighted. It's not only about publications, but about um, tangible outcomes of, of of this project. And you know, and being part of a WHO toolkit may have you know a decade decades long long legacy so so thank you for that work it's a pleasure now uh, to to um, highlight to introduce well you know most most of you know her Yeda Orioli who is both from Argentina and Brazil and she was really intricately involved in birth defect surveillance and we were so we felt so honored that she was willing to join Zika plan in 2016 with the objective to just to really strengthen birth defect surveillance in the Latin American region. Over to Yeda. Thank you. Uh, and just unmute yourself. Oh, uh, sorry, but um, <laughs> very good to hear you now. Good. Are you seeing me? Yes, we see you also. Okay. And are you seeing my screen? Not yet. I'm not yet. Okay. Let me then see. Oh, sorry for that. Okay. Okay. And now Sherry screens here. Excellent. Very okay. Good. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to present the RELANC, the Latin American Network 
for congenital malformation surveillance. In 2015, when Zika virus epidemic was linked to microcephaly in Brazil, we want to know the microcephaly prevalence in Brazil before 2015 to confirm the epidemic and to calculate the Zika virus risk for the pregnant woman. And two flaws hampered the correct answer. Sinask, the Brazilian live bird system underreported the microcephaly, showing around five cases per 100,000 live birds. The other flaw was the ICLANC, a Latin American hospital based network with good coverage of a good report of bird effects, but with only one hospital in northeast of Brazil. In 2015, besides the ECLANC network, there were 15 population-based registries working on 10 countries. However, they are not networked like the ICBDSR, the clearing house, networking 43 registries around the world or the Eurocat covering the European registries, or the National Bird Effects Prevention Network in the United States of America. So to increase the Latin American surveillance on bird effects, we proposed to network the population-based registries and the Clank Hospital Network to provide validated and updated basic frequencies for the entire region. We knew about Zika virus and microcephaly on October 2015. In October 2016, we succeeded in financing the project and it was proposed to the Latin American registries. They accepted it. So during 2017, we develop, developed the regulative and constitutive norms. We did a data sharing pilot in 2018. In 2019, there was full data sharing and the database was consolidated. Last year until now, we published the network construction and the first results. And uh, now we are finishing the web page setup to permit the public use of the relink data. This, this short time to set up relink was only possible due to the ECLANC network of people interested in bird effects since 1967. The traditional ECLANC annual meetings, the EUROCAT and ICBDSR previous experiences in networking, and to our Zika plan team, mainly Helen Dog and John Morris. Sri Lanka shares around 3 million and a half birds a year. Most of birds came from the Brazilian system, but also national registries like Paraguay, Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, and the regional like Nuevo León in Mexico, Nicaragua, Cali, and Bogota in Colombia, Maule in Chile, São Paulo in Brazil. The white dots show the countries where there, were, there are ECLANC hospitals. 
So from Bolivia, Peru, and Venezuela, the information on bird effects came through the Eclanc network to Relan. Three national registries, Cuba, Panama, and Colombia, are not yet sending data to Relan. They need the Relanc to be recognized by international health agencies like WHO and FAHO to share, to share data with other countries. The first three years analysis showed heterogeneity among the registries in the prevalence rates of stew birds, congenital anomalies, microcephaly, Down syndrome, and other effects. Most of the heterogeneities result from differences in rules or quality of registration. Both are important to data interpretation. Our plans to relunk concern prevention and control of bird effects. We want to focus on well known avoidable bird effects, all caused environmentally and subjected to control, mainly worsened by poverty and poor health care, like, for example, the six examples of environmentally caused microcephaly, the gestational diabetes mellitus, cytomegalovirus, toxoplasmosis, alcohol use during pregnancy, Zika, and rubella virus. We pretend to develop research methodology for environmental causes of birth defects. Remember that genetic causes are permanent but environmental ones are punctual in time and harder to study. Foment epidemiological research on maternal diseases or habits. Promote codification using ICD-10 codes out of the chapter 17, since, for example, the STORCH infections are not coded inside the birth defect chapter. Increase interaction, mainly with international organisms, WHO, FAHO, Ministries of Health, since they are responsible for implementing our suggested policies, health policies. For us, the legacy of the Zika plan is the Relanc itself and its power to detect new epidemics faster and to prevent and control bird defects increasing, increasing the research in the area. Um, our gratitude to the European community through the Zika plan leaders and the figures of Annelise and Raman, Brazil institutions that sponsor these projects, and our ICLANC and RELANC team. Thank you very much. Yeah for the questions. Thank you so much um, to the three speakers. Um, it's, it's open for any questions also from the panelists. If panelists want to ask or comment, please just turn on your video. But I have one question already. And it's from Sonia Leonhardt, who says she's wondering if uh, the birth defects app, besides being able to differentiate between different types of birth defects, is also able to capture the underlying causes. So, for example, torch versus other causes. Over to Helen. And please unmute yourself when you do answer and turn on your videos as well. <laughs> 
Can you see me? I'm having some technical difficulties here. It's disappeared from my screen. But anyway, if you can see me, that's great. Um, uh, no, it's, um, it, it doesn't do that. It has some advice on congenital maternal infections um, and links to um, other documents where um, more information can be found on, for example, the WHO guides on congenital syphilis and congenital rubella syndrome. Um, so it links out to uh, guidance for laboratory um, uh, verification of infections, but it doesn't actually incorporate it. It could in the future, and there is great potential, not necessarily in the one app, but in a, in a series of apps, um, to incorporate more of that sort of information that can be used diagnostically. But this app is really more for surveillance use, not for diagnostic use. As a first step, what we weren't trying to do is to get in the way of the referral pathway and the proper diagnosis of the child by experts. We're not we're not trying to promote non-expert diagnosis of congenital anomalies. It's really a surveillance tool more than a diagnostic tool as part of the clinical care pathway. But there are huge needs to develop clinical pathway tools and that we're discussing at the moment, but that's not what the app presently is. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, anyone from the panelists, a question or a comment? to Ieda on birth defect surveillance, Helen or Trudy? Trudy, I have, I have a question to you. So, so um, you know, the money will now end in the, on literally the 31st of March um, for, for READY. Um, yes, you have said there is funding, you know, through, through the Gates Foundation, et cetera. But, but how would you, how, how do you think this kind of work is sustainable beyond now the current EU funding that, that has now, is now coming to an end. Uh, and and with yourself. You'd have thought after a year or so we'd all must that. <laughs> um, so because we've, we've drawn ready from the get-go within the wider global health network and then taken this, the subsequent step to place it within Fio Cruz, this just forms this falls within our ongoing sustainability plan and this is um we're pivoting the leadership of the global health network south so we have leadership centers in latin america asia and africa and and we have a, a really comprehensive uh, consortium funding model to take us forward for another 10 years and so ready will sit within that and we want ready and the, and the, the global health network southern um latin american leadership team to be writing and winning their own funding and, and working with other networks. And so we're, um, so it, it, it does have a very secure future. But I have to say, though, that it's probably a good point to say that the, the difficulty always is, is that it's very difficult to get funding to support research infrastructure and capacity building because it, it falls out of the usual stalls of, um, of funding. It's very difficult because it's the, the impact that we're bringing isn't running a particular study and so for most funding research institutions it's very difficult to fund the work we do and it's a constant battle so i'm saying this like, oh yes we've got our funding completely fine but it's really really difficult and all the organizations we work with are very supportive and they absolutely recognize our impact but they do not have funding streams that say research structures, infrastructures, and innate research enabling. And as we've just learned, we need those research capacities in place. And so my call to the funders is, you know, really to get together and have some funding streams that are absolutely around long-term building lasting capable teams that doesn't necessarily get hung on one research study because that's too short-term. Yes, indeed, most most funders, you know, fund hypothesis driven uh, research questions rather rather than setting up uh, networks or infrastructures or surveillance for that matter for, you know, also for YEDA. And often it has to be governments that that then uh, then step in and, and fund uh, these kinds of issues. 
Helen and Yida, I have another question for you. You mentioned that you want to bring your experience from Latin America to Africa. Can you elaborate more on that? You know, what can we learn from Latin America, but what is also different? You know, where do we need another network or another approach for Africa versus Latin America? Um, well, Latin America was a little different in that it started with a lot more in that, as Ieda was describing, it started with a number of national re and regional registries and a, and a hospital based network that's been going for a long time, whereas Africa has a lot um, less going on at the moment um, of, of very limited surveillance projects currently working, although there are some across African countries, but they haven't um, worked together in a network. So um, whereas um, Latin America, there was some networking, but between hospitals. So um, it's very important to use the experience of Eurocat in Europe and, and uh, Latin America, just the concept of networking and how much power each center can get from being linked to the others, from discussing with others. There's far too little expertise in any one country and we need to share expertise and share resources in order to go forward and also share data. Um, as Ieda said, um, the, the pilot of the data sharing in Latin America showed the great heterogeneity in data being collected by the different systems. And that really helps, and, and it's the same in Europe, if one was to do the, the uh, show the same graph in Europe, and that really helps systems to think about their own characteristics, how they're collecting data, how that should be interpreted, um, what are the real differences between countries in congenital anomaly prevalence, and which ones are to do with diagnostic systems and reporting systems. So it's, it's really helpful to come together and compare data and discuss and to share the very different expertise that um, exists in, in, uh, in the different countries. So um, then there are other aspects and, and we're hoping to learn a lot from the, the recent pathway of RELAMP in terms of setting up a memoranda of agreements, in terms of data sharing mechanisms, um, how to put together the, the um, data manual all those things that uh, are required for a, for a networked approach. There's a, there's a huge uh, wish in the African network to, to start with a high degree of data harmonization. Um, and it, in a sense, it's easier to harmonize data when you're starting than when you've already um, gone down a load of different pathways and now you have to <laughs> harmonize it after the fact. So it's a, it's a good moment really to start about to start thinking about harmonized data collection. So um, there are many ways in which we can learn from RELAMC, the, the RELAMC experience, and from the Eurocat and American and other experiences um, before that. Well, 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 thank you. And, and so I hope that you will have a lot of um, meetings in the future, unfortunately not funded now through SIGA plan, but through other uh, modes, including WHO, because WHO has a vested interest and, and you know one of the learnings from SIGA from the Zika epidemic was indeed we need to strengthen birth defect surveillance and thank you for addressing this need. I have um, one comment I read here under the chat from Michael Msal. <laughs> I don't know which country he's from, but he says an important lesson from the past was the US collaborative perinatal project from the 1950s to 60s. So designed to understand pathways involved in cerebral palsy, epilepsy, intellectual disability and blindness, the group saved maternal blood. They discovered how important congenital rubella was and the critical importance of not only detecting severe forms of the spectrum of this virus. I think this is a very good reminder. As we all know, initially we were all biased towards the, the phenomenon of microcephaly and, and, and because of the three Zika consortia, we've really learned the full spectrum of disease, but it's also only because we have enhanced our surveillance. So thank you to Michael for his comment. Uh, with that, um, I think, uh, is there any burning question here or any comment, Trudy, you would like to have like a, like a final word here before we have a five minute um, biological break? 
No, thank you. I think it's um, it's been such a great session and it's been uh, particularly excellent to work with Helen on this because uh, she this was one of the most significant outputs for us, I think, from this is without this programme, we wouldn't have brought our work together. And, and it's the same is true for um, the Brain Infections Global and the Vector Hub. You know, this has really been what it's been about for us is joining up these projects and, and making everybody's impact greater by, by sharing this more widely. And, and I think finally, just to add that last piece of my hammering the message home about um, needing to have completely dedicated support for truly embedding research competencies in every area of healthcare delivery. And that would be my, my call out to the funders for, for that. Thank you. And I, I want to encourage everyone here to go to the Global Health Network a website where you literally can find everything what's presented today and what, what Trudy mentioned, including all the training resources, the communities of practice, but also the Bird Effect app um, and also the Vector Hub that, that you just mentioned and, and various other networks and, and resources, but also the publications of Zika Plan. So Zika Plan is also hosted in the on the Global Hub Network. Uh, website so so i think um i please do go and this is this is our legacy the website is the legacy the le website will remain i hope <laughs> and and with that all the resources 